Would you resist if the fascists irradiated the countryside, poisoned food supplies, made rivers unfit for swimming and so filthy you wouldn't even dream of drinking from them anymore? If fascists systematically deforested the continent, would you join an underground army of resistance, head to the forests, and from there to boardrooms in the halls of the Reichstag, pick off the occupying deforesters, and most especially those who give them the marching orders? That is a video from the website of Deep Green Resistance. That's also the title of the book I'm holding in my hand. It's a group of people that want a greener planet, a better planet, but the lengths they're willing to go to to obtain that might shock you. It includes direct military-style attacks on infrastructure, on industry, uh, includes tactics such as assassinations. Does that shock you? One of the authors of the book, Eric McBay, joins us now from Kingston. Uh, Mr. McBay, thanks for coming in. Um, I think a lot of Canadians, even if they support environmental movements, uh, would be shocked to hear direct military intervention as uh, an acceptable tactic. Well, I think that what we're discussing is not really military intervention. Um, but, you know, to put things in context, we really have to think about the situation that we're in right now globally. Um, we are in a, a very dire situation in ecological terms. More than 90 percent of the fish in the ocean have been wiped out. Uh, the topsoil is being destroyed 20 times faster than it's being created. Most of the tropical forests are gone. Um, and the reason that many of us don't notice this in our daily lives is because partly that we live in the wealthier parts of the world and partly because we've been insulated by cheap oil, which allows us to, uh, to easily import you know, food and other resources far away uh, very easily. Of course, the days of cheap oil are coming to a close. Um, and in addition, you know, climate scientists are very clear in warning us that we're approaching uh, ecological tipping points uh, in climate change. And that if we continue to release greenhouse gases in the enormous amounts that, that this culture has been doing, uh, that we will reach a point where that becomes irreversible. Even if we stop releasing greenhouse gases tomorrow, that the greenhouse gases in the Arctic uh, would melt and be released into the atmosphere, that the tropical rainforests would uh, have perpetual droughts and die. And that I, this... I, I... And I've heard a lot of that from people that don't advocate some of the goals that you do. I want to bring up a, a quote board with one of the goals from the book. It's a section that you wrote. It says, goal one, to disrupt and dismantle industrial civilization to thereby remove the ability of the powerful to exploit the marginalized and destroy the planet. So you want to dismantle industrial civilization. What does that mean? mean? Do we, do we give up on cities? Do we shut down industry? Do we go back to living an agrarian lifestyle where we're all substance farmers? Well, I think that the, the, the key idea to think about here is hierarchy and expansion, that industrial civilization, industrial capitalism is based on perpetual expansion. Um, and it does that in a way that enriches uh, the people who are already in power, bailouts, even when their greed causes, causes the system to crash. Uh, those are the same people who are, in the short term, profiting from the destruction of the planet. Um, and so it's the same people who, who pay for the fallout of stock market crashes, all of us who are going to pay for the effects of their, of their destruction of the planet in the long term. And if we want to, uh, to have a different society, then it's going to be a society that's based on human rights, that's based on ecological sustainability. But you're not, telling on... me, you're not telling me if you actually believe in, in dismantling capitalism and leaving behind cities and industry to return to an agrarian lifestyle. How do you dismantle industrial capitalism and still have a civilization with cities, with public transportation, with television, with the internet, all the things that people use now? Well, I guess the question is, is it worth it to, to have, you know, Twitter if it means that there's no food or that most of the people on the planet are living in a state of, of perpetual privation because of runaway global warming. The point I was trying to make earlier is that is that climate scientists are clear that if we don't stop immediately, you know, releasing these huge amounts, that we're looking at a future of mass starvation around the world, that we're looking at perpetual wars um, over uh, basic supplies, basic resources like water, and that much of the planet's surface may be uninhabitable. So I think but, when we're talking about the scope of these kinds of problems, we have to say, well, what is it going to take, first of all, for us to have, uh, you know, the basic necessities of life, for people to be free of hunger, to people have the things that they need? 
And then we can talk about other things that are, you know, non-essential or that are luxuries. Um, it, it, that which, so someone will decide what's a luxury and what you can have and what you can't have. No, not at all. Uh, I think that those in power will continue to do what they've been doing so far, which is that they'll try to make money um, regardless of the human or ecological consequences, and that some people um, will try to struggle against that to maintain a livable planet. And this I, is not going to be some kind of planned out scenario in which, um, you know, everything is decided in advance. This is about trying to, to fight for a livable future, which is very much in danger at this moment. Um, I think part of the reason that people don't, uh, you want people to realize that they have to stop now, that they have to stop emitting carbon dioxide or the world's going to end. And I think the reason that a lot of people don't buy that is that the environmental movement is a bit like the boy that cried wolf, because going back to Malthus, people have been saying for the last, what, 300 plus years, if we don't stop this, we're going to, we're going to have too many people, everyone will die because there won't be enough food. He was proven wrong. In the 1960s, we had population bomb with Paul Ehrlich. In the 1970s, I remember the, uh, the scare over global cooling. I thought I was going to live in an ice age. Now we're being told uh, the ozone layer, and, and, uh, and then it became uh, global warming. So there is a history of people not believing doom and gloom scenarios because they don't come true. So, well, I don't think this is a future gloom and doom scenario. I mean, look what's happening in the Horn of Africa right now. Um, we're talking about the long-term effects of civilization of colonialism right there in war, dislocation, the destruction of soils. And if we want to talk about projections of the future, then we should talk about both sides. Um, you know, back in the 60s or 70s, the common belief was that we would be living in space colonies in the moon right now that would be flying around the solar system. And, and, and so that's, we had that, that on that's one ridiculous. Side, and on the other side, we had people saying, well, you know, this is going to be a future where the planet is destroyed. So yeah, it, which is why the, I don't believe all kinds of future predictions. But well, you're, you you're, look at you're looking two, at the future. If you look at those two, in terms of, you know, 90 percent of the fish are gone, most of the tropical forests are destroyed. What are we closer to right now? You are, uh, I, I, I can't cite these statistics and I don't know, I haven't seen footnotes in the book for some of what you're citing, so we'll let that pass. But you're actually advocating and describing how to go about and kill people to achieve your means. I want to bring up the That's other quote for Don. Well, let me That's bring incorrect. up, the, let me bring up a quote from the book where you talk about assassination. You say, uniquely valuable individuals make uniquely valuable targets for assassination by resistance groups. You spend uh, a whole chapter talking about how to target different groups, how to target uh, different um, high-level operations, be it petroleum, be it individuals. You have a chart saying, is it strategically worth it and just? Is it unjust? Is it a good idea to go forward? You're educating people on how to overthrow government. There's lots of books out there that talk about military strategy, but you're actually talking about overthrowing governments in Canada and the U.S., and describing how to assassinate people. Why are I think you... That's a, that's a very inaccurate summary, I think, of that section in particular and of the book. This book is about how to make environmental movements effective. Um, up to this point, you know, environmental movements have relied mostly on things like uh, petitions and lobbying and letter writing, and that hasn't worked. That hasn't stopped the destruction of the planet. That hasn't stopped the destruction of our future. It certainly hasn't reversed it, which is what we need. So so, and so, so the but, point is that if we want to be effective, then we have to look at what other social movements and what resistance movements have done in the past. And so you, we and so you cite the IRA and other groups that a, a, tried to achieve their goals through a campaign of terror and assassination as people to look up to. And you spell out, you say, people should be asking, is this an exceptional person or does his or flu her influence come from her role in the organization? You spell out the questions you need to ask on whether someone should be assassinated or not. How are you not advocating and encouraging people to consider, should I assassinate the prime minister or the president or the person in charge of the environment department because they're not doing enough? How can you say that you're not advocating that? I think that the book makes it very clear that we're not advocating that. The point of the book, as I was saying, is that we look at historical resistance movements and social movements like the struggle to end slavery, like the civil rights movement, like liberation movements against occupation, and we discuss what tactics they used and what strategies they used. Um, and we discuss what is effective and what is not, what works and what doesn't. And if you read that entire section, 
uh, I think our conclusion is quite clear that assassination is not something that environmental groups are going to find useful. If we dismantle civilization, won't that kill millions of people in cities? What about them? Derek Jensen replies, no matter what you do, your hands will be blood red. What should the population be at, Mr. McBay? You say that there's too many people. What should it be reduced to and how do you get to that point? I don't say that there's too many people. I think that I say that industrial civilization is consuming too many resources. That's really the central point. It's not about numbers of human beings. It's about how many resources, or how much resources, how much energy people are consuming, how much pollution they're releasing. So someone in the United States, for example, might release uh, or might consume 30 times as many resources as someone who's living in, uh, in a so-called unindustrialized country. And so if we want to stop destruction, we don't look at population. What we look at is consumption, and we look at uh, the power structures that allow those in power to take the resources away from, say, indigenous people uh, who've been living on their land for thousands of years and who uh, you know, don't want to see those resources taken away, but they're often taken by force. Well, Mr. McBay, thank you for your time today. Thank you.